I'm Brian Foster, and this is the Grindhouse Institute. On each episode of this podcast, Jeremy Floyd and I program a triple feature movie night. Each of the movies share common themes, and we discuss them here. We're happy you could join us for today's episode, entitled Nolan Noir. Before venturing into deep space, infiltrating dreams, or creating Academy Awards sweeping spectacles, Christopher Nolan, alongside his cinematic collaborator and life partner Emma Thomas, burst onto the scene crafting captivating films firmly rooted in the film noir genre. On today's episode, the Grindhouse gang will follow Nolan's early work, perhaps even finding a few mementos to cherish, with the hope that afterward we can all catch up on some much-needed sleep. A lonely author discovers a remedy for his writer's block by trailing strangers across the streets of London. What begins as an innocent curiosity soon transforms into a descent into the depths of the criminal underworld. After all, you know what curiosity did to the cat. Jeremy Theobald, Alex Haw, Lucy Russell, and John Nolan star in Christopher Nolan's Following from 1998. A man's quest to avenge his wife is hobbled by a rare condition that causes him to have no short-term memory. I told you this already, haven't I? Along the way, he will be introduced and reintroduced to a rogues gallery of friends and foes. But who can he trust? Can he even trust himself? And who the hell is Sammy Jenkins? Guy Pierce, Joe Pantoliano, and Carrie Ann Moss star in Christopher Nolan's Memento from 2000. A veteran detective from Los Angeles is summoned to a small Alaskan town where the sun never sets. He's in town to help catch a young girl's killer. When he confronts a suspect, the two men form an unexpected bond, setting the stage for a psychological game of chess. But it's just so hard to play when he hasn't slept in a week. Al Pacino, Robin Williams, Hilary Swank, and Maura Tierney try to get some shut-eye in Christopher Nolan's 2002 film, Insomnia. Thank you for listening to the Grindhouse Institute. Please enjoy. We need a wild card. A wild card? Yeah. Something that's there. Something we can use. You know, it's an every good detective novel. That's what it's all about. Interrupting someone's life, making them see all the things that they took for granted. You take it away, you show them what they had. I should kill you. Quit it, Lenny, come on. You're not a killer. That's why you're so good at it. All right, welcome back to the Grindhouse Institute. I'm Brian Foster, and with me as always is Jeremy Floyd. Hello, and how are you? Have I told you about my condition? <laughs> Only every time we meet. I can't make new podcasts. <laughs> oh, I've told you this before, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, on this show today, we're going to be talking some early films uh, from Christopher Nolan, who is now, wow, recognized at the top of the echelon here in movies and has been, but now he's, you know, riding the wave of Oppenheimer. And mm-hmm. we're talking three of his early films following from 1998, Memento, 2000. Insomnia from 2002, and with us is a very special guest to talk about these films. Jeremy, if you could please do the introduction. Absolutely. So we are diving into some Nolan noir here, Mm. and um, it's pretty rare that we go to (laughs) more than one source for film noir discussions, but um, (laughs) this one felt like uh, we needed to change it up a little bit. And, uh, you know, I know that these three movies in particular were in a sort of uh, canon uh, with this guest here. And, you know, it's something he likes to reference all the time. And um, I thought, uh, who better than to have back friend of the show, Andy Buigas. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Very excited. Very excited to uh, talk about these three uh, fantastic films. Welcome back. It's good to have you back and great to talk about these films. Let's get it going. Sounds Andy, good. Yeah, yeah. was this your choice or was this a Jeremy thing or did we, was this more of a, just you needed to jump on and we needed to talk Nolan for any sp- particular reason? Well, it was a Jeremy choice, but I think it's, um, you know, we've always been, like Jeremy mentioned, referencing these three films as kind of, just kind of being iconic in kind of our film background and just in, you know, our, my personal history and growing up and, and uh, seeing these films and being influenced by Nolan and it's interesting because as Nolan has gone on to do more epic films and now is on the verge of winning an Academy Award, it, it's interesting to look back and see kind of how his career started. Um, and that I guess what's most interesting is that it started in a place in a genre that Jeremy and I really like to 
uh, work in and a genre that we really appreciate. So it's nice to go back to his roots and, and revisit some of these films. Yeah, and it, exactly. And, you know, it, it's funny how I think just in terms of, uh, I don't know, uh, um, looking at his career in general, these ones definitely give you a snapshot of, of all the things to come mm. and all the sort mm-hmm. of tricks in his sort of toolbox and then, you know, as well as the things that he's obsessed with and, and you know, we, we, we get a, a good sampler platter with these three. And what's interesting is how going from the movie he made for no money, shooting on the weekends with his friends and whatever, uh, to an indie movie but still no studio, and then to a full-on studio movie where he's essentially a hired gun, um, mm. all of them are in this sort of neo-noir, you know, film noir genre, uh, even though e- each one has a slightly different uh, sort of flavor to it. Hmm. Yeah, you can really see the evolution of Nolan in this. I feel like there's a lot of inspiration and in following that came from probably French New Wave and things like that, or that cinema verite. Yeah, or even like Clerks, maybe. I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, it, it, like the the no budget. 6,000 bucks, I read? Of the, of the 90s or whatever, yeah, yeah. I mean, like <laughs> the, the cost of film stock, yeah. I'd like to yeah. see that number adjusted for inflation, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, exactly. exactly. That's all all the film, right? There's no way anything else cost any bit of money on that. Or no one else could get paid. That's for damn yeah. sure on 6000 bucks. But he did everything, right? For this one, this is the first one that he did DP and directing and writing and helped with editing. I know he didn't technically edit it, but I know he had mm-hmm. a hand in it. So, I mean, he really made this one. No, exactly. And what's fascinating is uh, just how, you know, I don't know, his core team... Mm. from the beginning was was there i mean so emma uh who is his wife and and longtime producing partner and then uh on all three of these films uh david julian did the score this is the first time i've seen following so i've been introduced to this film even loving nolan for so long um but memento was the first one i saw from him uh yeah. but uh so did everyone i mean you know th- this is one you had to kind of go back and dig for uh unless you Happened to catch it in a film festival at the time. Still not much of an excuse for me not to have seen it for this long, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah. seeing where he's gone and all that. But I, what I was going to say was how, you know, you've got like the clerks and all those very hardcore indie films, uh, yeah. the inspiration there at least. But then... El Mariachi maybe, yeah. But then you get into Memento and there's a this like polish about it and the scope gets so much wider in the picture and the visuals and it just feels like such a huge jump for him from one to the next you know it's like a massive increase in talent yeah well it's almost like that every time he takes on a project he does this like sort of exponential leveling up this is not just a gradual no this is this is a pretty good one too no 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 (laughs) this tops the previous one in every possible way right but, but there's a lot of inspiration from all of them. Yeah. I, I think he inspires himself, and I think that there's a lot of following that comes or is in Memento. I feel like mm-hmm. probably could have worked at least partially for our Rough Draft idea episode that this was kind of that first lost person um, story that he tried, and then the Memento was just such a deeper version of that. You know? Right. Well, I mean, and, and just think about the opening shot of following. Yeah. yeah. And it's like really intense close-ups of a guy putting rubber gloves on and going through things and like and what was the opening of insomnia i mean it was the exact same thing and what was the opening of memento it's also you know someone oh yeah leaving or cleaning up or modifying a crime scene right yeah that's true that's true it it is interesting that he kind of begins all the films from the point of transgression and then it's all Mm -hmm. about either the events that have led up to it or the Mm -hmm. unraveling as a result of them right Memento's yeah. kind of both of those, right? Memento goes forward to back and kind of wraps it all around. Really well well crafted. But I think we should stick with following for a bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Glossed over that one. This this movie, um, it, it, it's got such a, a really gritty feel to it, not just for the filming alone, but the, the performances and everything. Uh, this is why um, seeing stuff like this or seeing images of this film back in the, when I saw Memento and hadn't seen this film but knew what it was and the internet was coming out and all that, and I started getting familiar with it, and I found out that Nolan was going to do Batman. I'm like, awesome. Are we going to get like a black and white noir Batman finally? Like, oh, yeah. you know, like an old school one where Batman's Batmobile is like some slick ass old car, maybe even a, a, a Rolls. And it's just like, you know what I mean? Like almost yeah. a detect- the real detective yeah. thing that 
if all every of version of Batman has missed every one of them. Like, yeah, um, except but, for maybe the cartoon. The cartoon was great. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I meant yeah. the the film, the the films, mm-hmm. you know. But I guess this last one yeah. was closest. But this is that was what I was kind of hoping. We didn't get that, and I still like his <laughs> Batman trilogy. But I would have loved a a black and white four by three Batman or something. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> right, gritty. You know, more but straight up noir version. Noir, right. dark. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and how fantastic was it to mm. see a Christopher Nolan movie coming in at mm-hmm. seventy minutes? <laughs> It, I know. It, it can be done. It can be done. Yeah, but it balloons up real quick when we get to Memento. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, it was it was pretty refreshing to start with a you know a little uh, short film there before we get into the the real features. Just give him six thousand dollars every yeah. time, and we could get a seventy minute real yeah. tight noir from him. Yeah. Go back to his roots. Yeah, exactly. There's no going back after fucking Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> you had an atomic bomb go off in, in yeah. cinema, you know, recently, you know, in 2023. It's like, yeah, you're not going back. You know, you know what I really appreciate about the following and every time I watch it is just it, it's so great to see how with this modest budget, this kind of contained narrative, he's really able to lean on kind of one of the themes that comes up repeatedly again in his films, which is the unreliable narrator and Mm. really couple that with the kind of nonlinear narrative structure and really be a master craftsman at how do you really create intrigue and tension and mystery by not showing you things or keeping you in the dark or being very selective, right? It's like he uses all the tools in a cinema bag to like really create this, mood and tone and yeah. intrigue right that really drive you forward and i think all his films really have this sense of driving you and sometimes to their detriment in terms of the pacing but for the most part like even the following where if you really think about it not much is happening it's relatively not at all yeah contained but this idea that you know because you have him being interrogated by the detective and things don't seem well because you're watching it and you notice that, wow, now I'm watching scenes with him with his hair cropped short and bruised up. Like, what didn't I see? What things am I missing, right? And I think he takes it to the next level with Memento, which is like, okay, we know the effect that that causes in you as a viewer. We're going to lean into it and make that actually part of the narrative, right? Because it worked for Seinfeld, right? FDR wants me to drop dead. FDR? Yeah, Franklin Delano Romanowski. The lollipop (laughs) episode going backwards. It worked. No, I, I agree with you. That was really well said. Um, yeah. I think that it's, you know, he goes even beyond, uh, you know, we thought Pulp Fiction was so impressive when it first came out as being this <laughs> nonlinear structure that completely made sense and the pe- puzzle pieces fit together. This is almost that same thing, but he even takes it a little bit further, um, right. I guess, with just the order of things. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. And his his uh, sort of always, his, his greatest strength has always been this like idea of how he builds the puzzle box. And just, you know, how intricate it really is and, and, and how it just really is just clockwork. Um, mm-hmm. But but it, it's it's interesting. So, like, you know, this is a film noir. You know, we've got a lot of the film noir uh, tropes in it. So, you know, it's, it's black and white. You know, really stark lighting, uh, especially for interiors. We've got, you know, a uh, Jane Russell-looking uh, blonde femme fatale here. Um, but what's interesting is, like, as the movie starts, you know... It sort of peppers these different subgenres in, and it you don't quite know what the actual subgenre is until you get to the very end, which is that like you know it starts off it's like this '90s sort of Gen Xer like self discovery. You know, who am I? What 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 am I doing here? I like to follow <laughs> people. I don't. I need to find my true calling in all these things, right? And knowing nothing about it, you'd think, oh, is this going to go in almost a Wong Kar Wai, you know, like a, a Chungking Express direction? Uh, because of the sort of poetic way he's talking about his sort of uh, very bizarre, but, but but also like, you know, lonely uh, philosophy that he has where he's, you know, uh, this lonely person in a sea of people, right? Um, then it sort of like turns into this thing where like, oh, is it a, it's like a robbery thing oh, or like a heist movie almost. And like, and then it becomes about, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to save the girl but no, it, as it turns out, the entire time it was just a con man, a long uh, con, yeah, l- long con movie by right. by the character whose name is Cobb, which is interesting. Cobb, interesting. It was like yeah. a recycled uh, name for uh, the main <laughs> character in Inception, right? The Leonardo DiCaprio right. character. 
think, same guy. I think I think mm-hmm. that was intentional. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Vincent Vega and Vic Vega. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> well, that was Cole. It was Cole. Is that your handwriting? Yes. Yeah, I didn't think about uh, this potential, like starting off and feeling like it could be a Wonka Y movie. But yeah, I guess if uh, it could have gone a whole different direction, if uh, he would have had the mamas and the papas playing. There. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. If he could have afforded the mamas and the papas, yeah, exactly. Speaking of that, the score of this one, I, when you brought up El Mariachi, that's kind of what it reminded me of. Oh, how, yeah. How El Mariachi's score is really strong, and I felt like that really took the, that movie to another level. I thought this one was great too, and it kind of had. True. Early, or it had like Hans Zimmer vibes to it, that like driving synthy, oh, well, bassy. Th- that opening cue in um, following is similar mm. to like I don't know one of the cues in El Mariachi when he's you know is first getting chased or whatever, and it's like that, and it's like exactly sounding. Yeah, and you could really see that he's leaning on the resources he has available, which is the score to really give the film a different dimension and something that I think really he continues to do in the rest of his career. Right. Yeah, Um, for sure. If you think about like the score in interstellar or inception, those are the scores that are in the car. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They're amazing. Exactly. And that's one of the things that I I really appreciate it. Right. Especially it's, it's the same thing you really appreciate about mariachi is just that when you have such limited resources, you have to be very intentional. And from what I was reading, like they did a lot of rehearsing, you know, they didn't have a lot of takes, not a lot of film. <laughs> exactly. It's one of the great artistic byproducts of having to shoot in film, right? Which is that mm-hmm. like, you mm-hmm. know, you really have to be intentional. You really have to work with the goal that you get in the moment. And it just creates something else because you're kind of forced to work within those constraints, right? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I love how, so, you know, he, he shot this thing. It was like on a it was 16 millimeter. It was like a wind up Bolex. Uh, apparently the way it was done, because, you know, it, it's so little money or whatever, it was they got the film sort of tell us I need to tape, cut it on tape, took it to festivals. And when they were there, they're like, hey, anybody uh, want to really? chip in some money to take this online and, and, and actually, you know, cut the negative and all that. And, uh, and, and, you know, sort of got it put together that way. So they yeah. initially released it in festivals on tape? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Holy oh, shit. Uh, is that real? Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. I bet it would look good on tape. <laughs> and, and, and what's fascinating is, okay, so at the time, so this is, you know, 98 or whatever. And a, a, at the time, um, you know, the, the sort of 16 by 9 TV wasn't uh, no. a, a, standard a, a, as much of a thing yet. Yeah. You know, so the early releases of this on you know DVD and whatever, it would be full frame essentially, yeah, because uh, it was it was shot uh, you know one through three, right. And and it's funny because even that is something that has kind of carried throughout uh, the rest of his career, starting with the Dark Knight, because the full frame IMAX format is one four three, which is very similar to the uh, framing size of the academy frame that he had on uh on following square more more square more, more or yeah. less yeah closer closer to square and he uh has also continued his uh, obsession with black and white but w- w- what's fascinating about this is like you know i love all the little um pieces in this and how he makes it feel like there's all the sort of um the scope of it is by choice, by opening up the world or whatever, you know, going out and stealing shots of them, you know, walking through the streets of London or whatever. Because that's how he did it, right? I mean, it, it feels that way, at least. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah. They were all just stolen. The you know, interiors but... <laughs> obviously were, you know, a little bit more composed and rehearsed right. and all that. But like they were like, you know, friends and families, houses and stuff. Yeah. But Andy said it. There's nothing really happening, at least for the first third of this movie there's really nothing happening but it's just got a good feel to it he's just walking (laughs) yeah yeah exactly i didn't really know what all this was about until this other guy arrived who apparently owed them some money they held him down and they smashed every single one of his fingers and then they smashed his skull someone get me a tea towel or something so what one last uh Fun little bit of trivia on uh, on following here. Um, so the main like uh, club owner and you know main gangster 
that they kept referring to as the bald guy, even bald though he guy. had hair, uh, <laughs> was, uh, was, was played by a real-life bartender and bar manager. And this guy was actually very sort of key in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s in bringing the cocktails sort of back to prominence. Really? And in cocktail circles, he's, he's kind of a, a big name that rings out in the streets. His name is Dick Bradsell. And the thing that he's probably most famous for is uh, inventing the espresso martini. So there you go. Wow. <laughs> Damn, That's I crazy. love the espresso martini. <laughs> big fan. And so how did, he, yeah. how did he end up in the film? And here we are in a bar called Detroit, Seven Dials. Um, Jerry, in his capacity as producer, one of the things that he did very effectively was to find locations. And this was a fantastic location that he found. He knew Dick, who was the manager of the bar, who when we came down in there for the first time to sort of scout it out, was there kind of going over the accounts with one of the people who worked for him and all the rest. And Jerry and I both decided after a few drinks that Dick would be ideal to actually play the manager of the bar. And it worked out very well. He did a great job. And then, you know, I guess it's not too surprising that his acting was a little less than convincing because uh, he's not exactly an actor. It felt like they might have dubbed <laughs> over his voice, too, or, or it just felt a little right. I mean, 80 yard for sure, but it was just yeah. a, some, somebody else was saying that, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I know what you're talking about. So there you go. There's yeah. a, a fun little yeah. trivia. That's interesting. So that brings in the Distinguished Spirits channel that we yeah. should probably <laughs> There you go. You know, yeah. in thinking of the following too, it's um, what what is actually really great and sticks with you. You know, even though the the scope of the film, like we said, if you think about it from a Nolan perspective, is you know probably the smallest of his entire career. You see the introduction of uh, what ends up being kind of a theme throughout all of his films, which is this character or these protagonists that are constantly both in a struggle to understand and get a grasp of their own reality but also trying to affect the world around them, right? So in this one, in the in the protagonist in The Fallen, you have this character who's like struggling to kind of find his path and figure out where he fits within this world. And then after he kind of finds a direction, he ends up trying to act upon his instincts and the kind of relationships that he has. And then at some point uh, kind of becomes consumed by it and kind of falls victim to it. You know, in Memento, we see that again with a character in a constant struggle, you know, uh, trying to understand just the reality that's going on around him. And I think that continues in Insomnia. And you see it a lot in a lot of the the other films where either it's characters trying to get a literal grasp around the, you know, reality around them or just struggling to, to affect these surroundings that are kind of getting away from them, right? Like an Inception or in Tenet, really. Um, you know, maybe maybe Oppenheimer is a little bit of the outlier there, although there is a hint at the beginning of that movie of him struggling with that internal conflict a little bit, even though that kind of right. disappears great. from for quite a bit of the film. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just really great to see how the inception of those themes and characters in his films. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's a good way to put it, because it's um, it's funny how uh, just how present some of these things are in some of his earlier work like this and also you could feel how he's playing around with this idea that what i show you and it, the meaning you get out of it is heavily dictated by when i show it to you right and this is idea that you know right. <laughs> he seems to play with time a lot and time seems to be an important theme in all his films and there's always this either characters fighting up against time whether it's like a ticking clock or it's just the way as a filmmaker that he uses time in the sense of both pacing and just the way he reveals information right like for example in this film you see his busted up face and following right his right cropped yeah. hair a lot earlier than it makes any sense right and you don't know what to make of yeah. it or for example i think it's a very early shot where you see somebody grabbing a single pearl earring and i right. forget he's placing it somewhere and it's funny that pearl earring seems pretty innocuous when you first see it uh, or even appealing, but think about the meaning it has later on where, um, you know, the character uses it to really seal the fate of the protagonist, right? So that is something that you really feel him experimenting with in this film and then really take that and refining that over the next few films. 
right i'd call it refining for sure in memento it's like polishing yeah. to a nice yeah. smooth surface <laughs> a sharp blade yeah and 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 you see the a, a uh, further exploration of the idea that the Cobb character talked about, where it's like you know you gotta mm. take something away for someone to appreciate it, and uh, that's my right. favorite line in the movie. <laughs> how how well does that describe Leonard's uh, you know goals and you know the way he he's structured his life? In a way, the Cobb character is kind of voicing the approach of the filmmaker, right? It's like you mm. take these little pieces away. And you create a whole different visual experience, right? You could still the set of earrings and it means one thing, right? You just robbed, but you take one away and now it could be misplaced, right? right? Mm -hmm. Or you drop an undergarment in someone's pocket and it means a whole (laughs) different thing than if you go ahead and just steal that from their dresser drawer, right? So it's really great because it seems to be like something, an idea, concept, an artistic approach that really appeals to Nolan and he uses it to maximum ability and to maximum effect and you could see here him experimenting with that which is really great absolutely hi all right what can I do for you Leonard I have this condition it's my memory since my injury I can't make new memories look I hope my condition is not going to be a problem for you no not as long as you uh, remember to pay the bill now did, did everyone here see this one in the theater when it first came out yeah, and I also feel like I'm particularly fond of this movie because I feel like it's one of having seen this very early on in my film development. It's just it was one of those where you started to see like, wow, like what you could do with just a really brilliant concept and executing it correctly. And it just made you ask more of independent films. Right. Um, yeah. I think. Yeah. When you're watching <laughs> yeah. It. And it was <laughs> so this came out in ninety nine. Two thousand. Well. It went to Venice in 2000, but no one really saw it till 2001. So okay. it, it, it wide you, released you, 2001. You feel like it was still riding that wave of that just fantastic period in film in the late 90s, um, you know, cresting in 99, yeah. that just had all these innovative, kind of relatively or independently made, a tour driven, relatively low budget films that just had really creative concepts and. You know, like a B and John Malkovich or mm-hmm. um, one of those great films of the late nineties. The Limey. That, the Limey. Yeah. It's just and if you think about it, even, you know, relatively speaking, the scale of Memento is not that big. You know, I mean it was what was it f- right. somewhere between five and ten million dollars. I mean, it's not that many locations. It's just a really great concept. The scale of which um, seems a lot bigger just because of the craftsmanship that went into it. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, right. we're, I'm sure we're gonna we'll get to this in detail, but even as you analyze the structure of the film and, and the way it's structured, just opening it on a shot literally played in reverse, right? Which later comes back. We just recently watched Tenet and uh, right. now you could see where he got that idea, right? It's like um, a lot of the film is structured in reverse, but the there's one shot, which is the open shot that's literally played in reverse. And I just remember being in theaters there, uh, being blown away by this idea of seeing like, you know, seeing the Polaroid develop in reverse and then the, the bullet kind of being sucked back into the, the gun and you're like whoa what am i in for here right yeah. or like you know he reaches his hand out the gun you know like whoop flies into his hand and then mm-hmm. you know shoots yeah it, yeah. it was wild and there was and, no and complicated the... explanation for what we were, what, why we were seeing that <laughs> there so was I really not. i really appreciate just, it just go with it don't don't even think about it <laughs> don't try to understand it feel it yeah um no exactly and it's it's funny you mentioned the tenet thing too because I, I I remember thinking like you know you remember thinking classic temporal pincer movement <laughs> <laughs> the structure of this movie is a classic temporal pincer movement exactly um, but you know Andy and I uh, watched it recently in, in IMAX and then uh, tenet that is and then you know we were talking about afterwards and like the the whole uh, let's just pick up bullets off the ground by having it you know, magnetize you know jump into our hand type of thing. Like, I, I kept waiting for that to sort of pay off with somebody doing that with a gun or whatever, uh, and it, it never did. And then we watch uh, the opening of Memento again, and they did it right in that opening scene. And what was so fascinating about it was, like, the movie does what a lot of Christopher Nolan movies do, which is sort of really overwhelm you the first time you see it. You know, you don't you don't know what to make of any of it. You know, it's like, you, you watch him kill Joey Pants in the very beginning, but then 
you, you don't know what any of that means or did that really happen did or it like even happen where is in time is this happening yeah. you know and it's like you know you, you you keep going back and forth between seeing these moments over and over again and we see him kill him twice essentially but because you're so you know uh unmoored uh from mm-hmm. all all your expectations of what it's supposed to th- this type of storytelling is supposed to be um you don't know what to make of it and you so you're you're kind of like on edge of like will we find out whether he kills Joey Pants or not? You know what I mean? It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of this weird... Yeah. Uh, How? Uh, why? Like, all yeah, those questions yeah. start popping up, yeah. Exactly. Talk about starting with a bang, right? I mean, you uh, yeah. literally get the murder, and it's kind of figuring out how we got to this point. Um, but most of the time, you're watching yourself going towards that point. So it is an interesting, right. right? Although I would argue that, I guess, if you'd seen it for the first time, there's not a lot of grounding telling you that you're working towards it, but eventually that starts to reveal itself. And so it is an interesting dynamic because you, you literally, uh, he's asking the, the, the audience to be the detective here, right? It's like, what, how do we put the pieces together to make sense of this violent act? It's hard though, because the pieces that are given to you are written by our unreliable narrator who right. doesn't remember things after 15 minutes let's say or whatever that time frame is that he has yeah. and it's like right those are the clues don't trust this person because of, don't trust their lies right is what it says right. but right wait was that was i was i being lied to when he told me right. that and that's why i wrote that or you know like you can't even yeah. rely on yourself like that's rough yeah i mean he, he had like full-on lies tattooed on himself with, with the, that's, that's what i mean like yeah. those were and those were the permanence in his yeah. memory but right. like the physical manifestation of a memory, right? Just right, like, right, right. <laughs> why is it backwards? So I can fucking yeah. see it in a mirror, you know? Like, <laughs> red rum. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the artistic choice to really keep you steeped in the perspective of Leonard really keeps you on edge because from the get-go, you know that you can't trust him. It's interesting, like, never right. have you jumped into a story where it's so blatantly explained that you can't trust this narrator, right? Because even the narrator yeah. doesn't know what happened. Right, right. Um, which is interesting because in, in just reading a little bit about the inspiration from the story and in the way he worked with his brother on the story, I knew that his brother had written the short story, but I didn't know that they kind of worked on it at the same time. And in the short story, for example, it's a lot more evident what's going on. I guess there's a third person perspective. And so there's a lot less of this ambiguity that Nolan just leaned into, which is interesting because it's one thing film allows you to do is just to be right. very subjective because you can only point the camera in one direction. You can never get the whole picture at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I think that was a fantastic choice, which is, okay, if I kind of tell this backwards, then it's the closest approximation of having the experience from the protagonist that like really can't generate new memories and so doesn't right. really know what happened immediately prior to a situation he's in. So you're kind of constantly being put in the shoes of the protagonist, which is why I think it's super effective and you're for a lot of it kind of on the edge of your seat because once you get the rhythm of how the story's coming out you're like oh what little piece am i going to get next right like oh i need a little bit more and the more i get maybe i could start to put a picture together and even when you start putting it together he saves a little bit for the end which is that like it's not just what happened is but how you interpret what your interpretation of what happened was right mm-hmm. which they still leave that a little bit up to interpretation right there it, it isn't fully clear Sammy Jenkins is what I'm referring to specifically. Was that right. a personification of his own guilt or was that an actual person that he had met? And was that just something that ha- had also happened to him? The odds of that happening are probably pretty low. <laughs> um, so it is probably that personification idea that Sammy Jenkins tried to distance himself from that guilt, right? So he created this other person, Stephen Tobolowski, yeah. right. who goes to see, right. John, who goes to see yeah. uh, Lennon. Uh, what's yeah, Thomas Tom Lennon. Lennon. <laughs> yeah, Thomas Lennon. Oh. What the fuck? It's a test, Sammy. We'll test this, you fucking quack. Who was also a doctor in Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, Dark right? Rises, sorry. Yeah, was Dark he Knight the same Rises, yeah. playing the same character? Was he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's the one that sees Bruce Wayne and fixes his legs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen worse cartilage in knees. It's good. No, that's because there is no cartilage in your knee and not much of any use in your elbows or your shoulders. I I think there is a lot of ambiguity and even watching it again, and the more you watch it, the more you can try to start making sense of it. I think if you watch it for the very first time, there's still a lot of questions, which is nice. You can come back to it, but... It's um, still got me. I've seen... This is probably the third or fourth time 
I'm pretty familiar with this one. Still hit me. Yeah. It's really effective. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of great details because one of the things that creates a lot of tension in the story and you start to realize it just from the very beginning, the way that the, the motel clerk is treating him is that yeah. people quickly take advantage of his condition. Right. It's just so weird, man. I'm, I'm yeah. fucking with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> And what that does, I think, you know, especially when you start to see like the scenes with Carrie Ann Moss, like really manipulating him. Yeah. It's just how challenging the condition is, but just how much the audience is being kept on tilt because, you know, it's not only what the characters are revealing to us, but it's also like, well, how are the characters around him that are very much aware of his situation really manipulating it? I think that's also the first time that we actually figure out how long that memory thing lasts, right? We see, actually see it in real time, I should say. Yeah. Well, I I, I think that it's variable because we do see it in different ah. intervals. And I think there's other pieces where time is shorter or longer. But yeah. like the fact that she could literally walk outside and come back in <laughs> yeah. with the bloody lip and be But like, we don't know how long she was out there. Well, you know. yeah. Oh. I well. think you have to be a little bit flexible. And I think maybe when we get to the end, I could... You know, talk a little bit about what <laughs> one of the things I noticed, but yeah, I think I think Jeremy has the right interpretation, which it's we're, it's supposed to be subjective because right. at, at different times it's a, it, and it makes sense. It's kind of affected by the situation and due to stress and things like that, right? It, it yeah. could be yeah. more or, yeah. or certain distractions or certain yeah. yeah yeah yeah, and also just there's also a narrative component too. I think at times the scenes are kind of stretched out and compressed just for pacing purposes. Um, So maybe we're not supposed to take them as kind of literal passing of time. But the important thing is that I think in those scenes and why they're so powerful is that the way they're revealed is you start to get his perspective where you meet characters when they're being very benign. And then we start to get kind of an objective stance where you see, oh no, people quickly take advantage of this. Right. And then it's almost like the, artist is making themselves known here because Nolan himself is pretty much saying I am going to take advantage of the audience and really mm-hmm. maximize this for effect in the film and Joey um, Pants was taking advantage of him for years right like right right so ultimately what it does is it sets up the climax which is you know what Teddy was doing to him all those years but it's just just really great because in a, in a way like the the, the director is making himself very much present and saying here is the trick that we're going to play across the whole movie uh, but we're going to use it to tell a pretty compelling story. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's like what kind of separated it from, say, a, a lot of movies that kind of came out in the Pulp Fiction wake. I know we mentioned Pulp Fiction earlier. It was like there's this idea that, oh, if you just get funky with how you present things and it's not just point A to point B uh, and you get, you know, in, in the case of a lot of Tarantino ripoffs, it was, you know, get silly dialogue. But like in, in, in this and one, it's like it, it's not just that they had a, a sort of funky way to present it, but that that presentation was like key to like being able to like experience the story. Yeah. You know what it made me think of that? That's actually kind of a, as a combination of that Pulp Fiction and Memento is Run Lola Run, which also mm. came out around that time. Cause wasn't that also told in a reverse structure? 98, right? Or 99? Yeah. Ni- 98. Yeah. 98. Well, no, it was like the same day three times or whatever. And it was like, you know, it was like three different versions of what, no, happened, but every right? time we saw it, we kept seeing more of it. Right. Well, no, we kept seeing, so we'd see that where she gets the call, she runs out and tries one path. It doesn't work. You know, oh, okay. gets the call, tries one path. It doesn't, doesn't work and tries another path. It's like a video game. <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. She <laughs> le- learns how to play the game much better. She has three lives. But it was yeah. <laughs> like you said, this time in film where people were playing, like, how can I manipulate the, presentation of these events right like how can i take a different narrative structure than just the standard pointing to point b and really use it to heighten the quality of the story right right and 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 there were a lot of great examples of that time i mean you know um like you said um, the limey yeah run lola run the limey i mean even in a certain way uh blair witch project it's like there's a bunch of movies that played with how we uh, see and experience things that you know the studio system previously would have you know kind of rounded off all those possibilities and like you know sh- cut them short and be like no 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 we're gonna tell this you know the right way or whatever right right think about traffic and think about it, the non traditional yeah. editing style that that has exactly it felt like an anthology though right I mean it, it, it did kind of fall within that yeah traditional I mean, it, anthology it, I mean that's what I'm saying yeah because it it's um. It's a little uh, almost um, Robert Altman, a, a little bit of the Pulp Fiction, you know, convergence thing. 
But um, in this one, like, the movie doesn't quite work without the sort of, you know, uh, differently ordered non-chronological structure. In fact, I think on the DVD, I, I don't think it still exists on the Blu-rays and whatever, but on the DVD, there is a way to watch Memento chronologically uh, where it, boring, start, it starts right? off in the black and white, <laughs> goes to the part where, like, you know, he shakes the thing and, and you know, we, we change to color and then, you know, get to the end with Joey Pants. But, like, yeah, exactly. It, it just, like, <laughs> as, a, like, a, you know, I don't know what, like, a, a film studies, like, oh, that's interesting to see. Fine. If you put it that way, yeah. like, what not what, to do, what, what, how it doesn't work. Right. But if you do you do it the, the, the funky way it was put together, it, it does work. Um, but it's one of those things where the form definitely, uh, you know, serves the function, you know. And it's funny, I, I forgot to mention this at the end of following, you know, we get into one of Christopher Nolan's very, very favorite things to do, which is while Danny Lloyd or slash the young man <laughs> uh, is talking to the, the cop, you know, we're kind of seeing other stories that, that are sort of happening as, as he's talking his way through into the sort of end of the movie which is that like you know we're sort of cross-cutting this action where it's like you know oh i i went to go do this so we'll check with her and like you know yeah we did and like, you know then we see the, what, what happened to her without seeing it very film noir there i know i love that i love the juxtaposition of what you're being told versus what you see yeah. and just no one really just luxuriates in that right yeah it's interesting to think that maybe coming up in that time, there was a big emphasis on that, right? It's like you said, the limey was a big one for that. There's just this element that like, as a director, what you can bring to a scene that's written is what you choose to show, right? And how do you mm-hmm. take that and really uh, create something else? It's kind of like the idea of take something away, showing, showing what you have is like, you take an element away or you add something or you show something in a different light and it gives something a completely different meaning right mm. exactly it could also be the like the ending of the conversation <laughs> yeah <laughs> right exactly. yeah which is interesting because the whole movie gauges on how interpreting a line yeah different right he'd kill yeah. us if he had the chance he'd kill us if he got the chance yeah that's <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah it's a great one yeah kill us um, if he had the chance <laughs> but it, it's it's great because it's like uh it, in at the end of um, at the end of following, you know, he he does the cross cutting thing, and like he, Nolan, that is, has been very very obsessed with that tool going forward, and you know, and even in Inception. his giant epic movies yeah. like Inception, it, the the Dark Knights, Interstellar, even Oppenheimer did this a lot, where it was just like a lot of this intercutting thing uh, between the sort of like you know the A plot and the B plot, and you know, and it's funny he does a version of that in Memento, but it's just glimpses and it's it's almost like memory fragments mm-hmm. and there's so many good moments where you're seeing the mind's eye of guy pierce remembering his wife and mm-hmm. it, it's crazy how much it really feels like what it's like to remember something where you, you don't have the full picture of what that whole day was but there's this one little brief you know moment in time that that stands out to you and then there's that thing at the very end where he he sort of does this style again but it is either showing us things that never happened or showing us the way that leonard wants the world to be and we're seeing all you know his mind just like racing and in it we see this shot that i have a hard time explaining where leonard's wife is sitting with him he's laying in bed shirtless and you know she's kind of resting her head on his chest and in the spot where he's like pointing to in the like, look how happy you were that day you actually killed him. I thought you'd remember for sure and you didn't. It says, I did it. Oh, interesting. I don't know if I caught that. Was that very brief? It, it was very brief. And then they held on for, for, for the, like, they showed it to you three times and they, they held on to it for, for the last one. Oh, interesting. And, and, yeah. and it's, huh. during the, it's during that moment where it's like, you know, Teddy's looking for his keys and, yeah. you know, Leonard's writing, yeah, yeah. you know, don't believe his lies. And yeah. like. He's like, eyes, listen, yeah. uh, everyone lies to themselves uh, when they look in the mirror and do these different yeah. things. And and as he's like driving what turns out to be towards the tattoo parlor and he's doing the thing where he's like closing his eyes while he's driving. Yeah. He's like, hey, if I close my eyes, I, I, am I still here? Am I still yeah. here? Yeah, I know. Yeah. 
Uh, if I let the, go, do you think you could fly? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, he's channeling the good son. And like, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, yeah. it, it's like, yeah, he, uh, w- w- we see these like flashes of, uh, you know, it is accomplished or whatever. It also has a, what is that groundhog day, right? Where you're just like closing his eyes and going off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, don't drive on the railroad tracks. Uh, that's one I uh, happen to believe in. <laughs> <laughs> I want some flapjacks. <laughs> yeah. But you're so right. The way he visually captures the way your memory flashes and how unreliable but just how powerful it is like as an emotional shock to your system yeah it's, it's like very really evocative feel that. yeah yeah that's why he was the right person to make inception because he i think he understands dream logic or illogic whatever that you want to call it right follows no actual logic and i think we really have to highlight and just shout out the cinematography in the film because it's yeah. one of my favorite of all his films you know i kind of yeah. forgot a little bit about it, been watching it is that that very stark like still contrasty, but very just like realism that he has. It's just beautiful in the right. film. Like, it, it's expressionist it feels natural. and it's natural. It, it's very sort of Michael Mann. I right. Know. And yes. we'll, we'll get to it with Insomnia because I think yeah. there's some. Uh, oh, for sure. And, and I think, Brian, now we can actually speak to it. Um, yeah. There's definitely <laughs> some influence from Michael Mann in that sense. Yeah. I mean, very much so. I think this. I think this one too. I, I think maybe some earlier Michael Mann. This feels like a little bit of that, a little bit of Manhunter and Thief kind of. Thief, but, yeah. But yeah, I yeah. do agree that the next one for sure feels like Heat. Yeah, but the cinematography is so great because you're right. It's expressionist in the sense that Wally Fister really plays a lot with a contrast in these very natural settings, right? So like he never pushes mm-hmm. it to a sense that it feels sensational at all. There's kind of a Vermeer quality to it where there's something a little askew, but it's all yeah. feels very real, which I think also lends it to this quality of, of making you feel what a memory feels like, where a memory can feel very vivid. But like Leonard says in that really great scene, he's like, but a memory is totally unreliable. It can change the shape of a room or mm-hmm. change the color of a color car. Of a car. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is, are all things that end up happening in later Nolan movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> With the street exactly. rolling up on itself and in inception and things like that. Uh, it's interesting this idea right. or, or even the way that the spaceships kind of portrayed in um, in interstellar you know like there's this uh, in the, right. the, the twisting of time and space you know light and space um but it's just both beautiful it feels real but a little bit off you know and then even those moments where you have him retreating to those fond memories he has of his wife at least mm-hmm. initially there's just this warmth to it and this natural beauty to it that I'm always telling Jeremy really reminds me a lot of the thin red line, you know, and something that, that oh, yeah. Terrence Malick mm-hmm. does in his films and in the um, flashbacks in a thin red line when, um, Oh, I forget the character. He's flashing back to, to his uh, life with his wife back home. It's just very, very, the one uh, who like red. leaves him, that, that one. Yeah. Which also yeah. wasn't that 99 too. Interesting. Uh, 98. I thought that was the same year as uh, saving yeah. private Ryan, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just really feels like it's got this, Terrence Malick quality to it because there's this kind of warmth and very comforting feeling to it, but there's this realistic quality to it. And and it makes you feel like that's how, like I would feel having a nostalgic feeling for a very kind of beautiful time in your life. Right. And so uh, it's just, it's great how they contrast it. Right. Cause the rest of the movie is a little bit cooler, a little bit starker, a little bit on edge and or a little bit uh, askew uh, and then you have those flashbacks that really so like visually i think what they did was saying okay how do we use the visual component to create the kind of a physical emotion on how you perceive the world and the space right right and th- that's interesting you're saying about the warmth because like yeah the, the rest of the movie and all the characters even though they're joking around a, a lot sort of toward the beginning a lot of the characters like especially with with what they're aiming to do is just like ice cold in terms of like you know the way they're manipulating leonard or playing leonard against each other or whatever or spinning and, his beer yeah <laughs> yeah exactly gross uh so gross but yeah. the uh <laughs> the, the, but but that's that's the thing that like to me for the longest time really stood out about uh memento was how despite all of nolan's inklings which is to, to be very sort of Kubrickian and sort of cold and you know clock like and yeah. calculating you know this one couldn't help but have a heart to it and I and that heart came 
mostly. I mean, there's a little bit from Leonard, especially, you know, it's like. That scene where he's remembering his wife. Yeah. Well, there's that scene where at the diner where he's remembering his wife. But there's also the scene where he's like laying in bed with Carrie Ann Moss talking to himself, thinking right. that she's asleep and not hearing it. And he's like, you know, how am I supposed to heal if I can't feel time? And and then we see during the black and white sequences and when we're talking about Sammy and uh, like uh, remember Sammy Jenkins, right? And we see a handful of flashbacks with Stephen Tobolowsky giving quite an underrated and like beautiful and like touching performance. Yeah, like wow, yeah. A- as the guy who, too, or... who just yeah, mostly and yeah. Uh, who like test who's... this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Touch this, you fucking quack. Uh, <laughs> One of my favorite lines in the movie. Test this, you fucking quack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, just a test. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but 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 then you know there's there's that later part where he's like you know his, his wife is getting really frustrated and like you know he's like write it down he's like right, what do I do what do I do and like you know he's like kind of crying and like and then the part where you know she gives him the final exam and uh, you know he's like time for my time for my shot he's like oh great and like you know and then at the very end of that what when you know she's going into you know. Uh, the, 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 coma. the coma or whatever from the from having too much insulin you know his sort of childlike response to like it's like just like not knowing what the hell is happening and, and yeah. it's just, you know he's completely breaking lost down, yeah. and you know he's breaking down you know helplessness like, that that's, the, the, yeah, the, the, exactly the helplessness, the helplessness yeah. of it is like the sort of the heart of the movie and like sammy jenkins like holds that and to me what we get out of the end of the movie confession scene where leonard kills Jimmy, takes Jimmy downstairs to the uh, basement from Evil Dead, and then comes back <laughs> up and, and changes into his clothes. Right. Um, Tricks Teddy, confronts Jimmy. Teddy, yeah. all while remembering for an extended period of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's quite a long, uh, yeah, exactly, short-term period memory of, scene. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, Teddy gives him the straight dope, and he's like, yeah, it, as soon as I kill the right guy, uh, I'll, I'll know it for sure. And he's like, I thought you would too, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, here's this picture. And, like, now, there's no um, definitive evidence or whatever. Anything that was sort of holed up in court, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. You know, the, the, the Polaroid is bloody and, you know, his hand is covered in blood as he's pointing, uh, Leonard's hand is covered in blood as he's pointing at his chest in the, in the picture. And, like, and the things that Teddy is telling us, um, Teddy has already proven it with the very opening scene that when he is confronted he sort of lashes out at leonard by telling him the truth that no that's not who you are that's who you were and all that stuff right let's go down mm-hmm. to the basement let's see who you are buddy and mm-hmm. like you know his veneer of like the happy-go-lucky you know bonehead sidekick breaks down when leonard starts giving him too much shit and so to me it feels like in that ending where he's giving him the breakdown about like, yeah, I thought for sure this would have broken you out of it. And like, you know, no, Sammy didn't have this condition. He was a con man. Sammy didn't have a wife. You had a wife. Your wife had diabetes. Your wife is the one with insulin, that had the insulin thing. And, you know, and then we, we got that one flash in the black and white sequences, which were shot from a more objective point of view a lot of times. Right. Where St- Stephen Tobolowsky was sitting in the mental ward, not knowing what's going on, a doctor crosses, and right before the doctor crosses, we see a couple of, like flash frames of Leonard sitting there. And so, to me, it, it seems like the my interpretation of the ending, anyway, mm-hmm. or, or sort of the what was really happening the whole time was that you know, Teddy was manipulating Leonard to do these hits. He's like you know the the Incredible Anti-hero Hulk in, in 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 reverse, like you know, just going yeah. from town to town, you know, whacking drug dealers. Kind of his uh, Jason Bourne, yeah, yeah, and like in sort of unleashing. Yeah. Uh, Lenny onto the next town's, uh, you know, bad People guy. People he couldn't put away, basically, right? He just it, exactly. probably criminals. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so like, so, so Teddy, you know, uh, left his life behind, even though he still has his badge, and like, you know, then takes <laughs> takes Lenny out on on a little mission every once in a while. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Leonard sort of wants himself to be manipulated, which is why he destroys his own file. And he's like, that mm-hmm. file was complete when I gave it to you. Who threw those pages away, buddy? And, you know, we're constantly seeing Leonard burning stuff and, and trying to, like, do as he says in the black and white scenes where it's like, you know, through repetition, you can you can sort of condition yourself, condition yourself, condition yourself. And as he explains, you know, I'm going to 
give myself purpose and and chase another John G. Well, you're a John G. Why don't I chase you? And then he gets the uh, license plate tattooed on his thigh. But in that that interpretation, Sammy Jenkins, as we see portrayed by Stephen Tobolowsky, is Leonard. Mm-hmm. And like the the things that were sort of happening to Sammy with his actual condition, which you know, may or may not have uh, had his insurance claim denied, even though he worked for the company, um, <laughs> were sort of like scenes that we are seeing of Guy Pierce's sort of humanity. And and we see like just keyhole glimpses of that, you know, in certain scenes, like the, the, the Carrie on Moss scene where, where she's supposed to be asleep and he's talking to himself and, or where his like mind is like rejecting the like, you know, we see Leonard's wife go, ow, as he, you know, hits her with insulin. And he's like, no, that's not what happened. He, like, blinks and he goes back and he, like, pinches her thigh or whatever. Yeah. So you lie to yourself to be happy. There's nothing wrong with that. We all do it. Who cares if there's a few little details you'd rather not remember? Yeah, there's also a nice parallel there because the kind of reactions and the force recognition that Sammy Jenkins has in the flashbacks, you see Guy Pier- you see Leonard do that when he's engaging people uh, that he doesn't recognize, right? So right. there's this similarity. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I love that shot of him sitting down there in the hospital, and then you see the nurse pass by, and it quickly flashes the shot of Leonard there. I think that that's also a reference to the short story, because I think the short story actually takes place with Leonard in a mental institution trying to figure out how to get out. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting to see that now that you think about it, you're like, oh, yeah, who knows? Maybe at some point Leonard was you know, submitted to the hospital and who knows, maybe Teddy got him out, you know? So it's, it, it's interesting to see. I mean, what's interesting is that you could also take Teddy's story at face value. It does kind of have a similar impact, which is I right. felt sorry for him. His relationship with his wife broke down because as a result of the attack, the effect mm-hmm. on his memory, she couldn't live with it. And then Teddy really potentially did help him find someone that he thought could take the place of the assailants and help them kill him. And then he, just to see if it would help and it didn't. And so now he's kind of formed this relationship that he's taking advantage of, you know, I mean, it's possible that this is the first time he's taken advantage of it, but it is interesting because, you know, not likely. <laughs> I don't think so. Cause it, I don't think it could be a little bit of the Fukes dynamic and Barry, right? That's yeah. exactly yeah. how I, yeah, yeah, I was going to bring that up. It reminded yeah. me of, yeah, Fuchs. It's such a right. no, great it, comparison. It, exactly right. And, and, and it's, Root. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, he's acting like oh his, his uncle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and what's great is like then, you know, like Barry, uh, you know, was able to develop guilt in the show Barry. Uh, in this one, uh, you know, Leonard really wasn't wasn't able to. But it's there, right? He just can't remember. It, it seems like it's it, the guilt is there, at least yeah. the physical part of it. But he doesn't know yeah. really what it means or why it's there. He can't remember. But, but, but it is fascinating how much of a deadly weapon Leonard is. You know, Fuck when he's yeah. like sort of wound up, he, you know, he kicks he's Don's Jason. ass. I thought he was like and, yeah. Jason Bourne. He's yeah. just like this, <laughs> yeah. like, do- yeah. it's like finding Dory and Jason Bourne <laughs> put together, you know. He's Perfect. also not afraid to walk into a place knowing that he's got to kick some ass with a tire iron. <laughs> not afraid of, you know, am I going up against someone with a gun here? Or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's really honest about his condition every time, too, like before he beats someone's ass. Like, you know, I got yeah, yeah. this, this condition. It, it's interesting because one of the things I noticed this time, which ties in something I mentioned earlier is that it is unlike the rest of the scenes, his ability to stay in the moment and be cognizant of everything going on in the climax is extended. Now I think, I think you have to leverage Jeremy's interpretation of it, which is that for that period of time, he was just very cognizant, but you know, you have the climax, you have him killing uh, Jimmy, dragging him down, tricking Teddy, bring him back up, accusing him of setting him up and then getting the real story, then going out, and then deciding to continue his his uh, pursuit by misleading himself and and just grabbing a random fact. But another way that that could make sense that I thought was kind of interesting is he says that part of what's challenging about the condition is that you come to or you you uh, find yourself in a situation you don't recognize and you have these mm-hmm. feelings and you don't know why, right? You did right. something you feel guilty. And you don't know why. It's kind of like when you wake up from a dream and something bad happened in your dream, or you did something you shouldn't right, in your dream. Right, and you're right. like, "Wait a minute, happened to me did recently. that happen?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I it's felt terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you don't write down the dream or something, like you'll you'll just never remember it, and you don't you won't know why. It's yeah. gone. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, but this feeling that you have a feeling that lingers from the dream and and maybe guilt or sadness is like a gut feeling, a gut feeling, but you don't understand why. And I was telling Jamie, one interpretation of why the end he's able to kind of keep it together for such an extended period of time is maybe he he is forgetting where he's at, but he has this feeling he just did something guilty, like killing Jimmy. And so he goes up and perhaps his reaction of being confronted with the truth, and this is something he kind of retreats to, is when he's confronted with the truth, it's so difficult and his inability to cope because yeah, he can't rejecting it. Yeah. He can't move beyond it, right? He's kind of stuck in the same memory. Uh, his his way of coping is I'm just going to find a new clue because he knows if he has a clue, then it'll give him purpose. It'll give him drive. And so perhaps as he's moving from killing Jimmy to back up and and confronting Teddy and then stepping outside and throwing the keys out in the car at each one of those steps, he's maybe kind of forgetting what happened before, but has that feeling that something incredibly impactful just happened to me. And his reaction is, OK, I'm going to tear up some of the notes in the report or I'm going to just find a license plate and just cling on to it, right? And so that's how he keeps it going because kind of what we've shown in the movie, and you alluded to this, Brian, is that especially like intense situations, his memory seems to go pretty quickly. I mean, he literally jumps the fence at one point and he forgets immediately why someone's chasing him, right? And we see that. But I, <laughs> yeah, think, that's I think if he's if that memory lingers or that feeling lingers, I think what we learn, and, and I think you have the sense of what the real tragedy is that his coping mechanism has to be to kind of keep his story going, keep, keep this pursuit going because it's the only thing that could potentially give him comfort if he's literally stuck in the moment. What else has he got? Yeah. He's literally from a cognizant perspective. You're constantly, you know, rewinding back to this very traumatic point in your life and you can't build new memories that could help ease that pain. Right. Yeah. He, 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 Always starts from the same save point in the game. Uh, yeah, and it's just a terrible Every time. place to retreat yeah. to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. So right. that idea, I'd never thought of it before, but but his his actions being dictated by feelings that happen as a result of something that he pr- did, but he can't remember, has got to be pr- pretty horrifying, right? No, absolutely. Um, yeah, and it's it's um, it's one of those things where you know you imagine, okay, so he he was able to do this movie for you know, a couple million dollars, uh, it with independent financing or whatever, didn't have any distribution lined up and apparently was having trouble getting it distributed. Um, so supposedly Christopher Nolan's agent called Steven Soderbergh. Steven Soderbergh saw it and was like, yeah, it's great. And somehow maybe that helped, uh, get the wheels moving to get Memento out there. And then the same guy called Soderbergh months later when this exec at Warner Brothers, you know, won't take a, a meeting with Chris and Chris really wants to do this movie. They're remaking Insomnia. And apparently Soderbergh called up the exec and was like, you know, why don't you want to do it? And he's like, well, well, I, I didn't like Memento or whatever. He's like, yeah, but, you know, you saw it was good filmmaking, right? I mean, can't you just take the meeting and then, you know, you, you guys can work with him and whatever. And apparently that got Nolan in the door to get that meeting with Warner Brothers to get his first his sort of you know, studio picture going. And Soderbergh and, and Clooney were executive producers on uh, on Insomnia. Clooney, that's right. Yeah, I saw that. And that was the beginning of that long relationship with Warner Brothers that lasted exactly. what, up until Oppenheimer. Uh, yeah. Right. Anyhow, so it is fascinating to see like you know him going from no budget to having kind of a budget, uh, but still indie, to then going straight to a studio film. And this is at a time where studios made different levels of films they'd make a you know 120 million dollar you know tentpole blockbuster they'd make the sort of 40 to 80 million dollar big bigger budget movies yeah. and then and then they'd maybe have like a the sort of uh indie label like warner independent and uh pa- searchlight and you know searchlight yeah. and all these things but this one was sort of in that that mid-range at whatever it was 40 50, million dollars 45 yeah. for uh for insomnia and, you know, he kind of levels up again in terms of the cast and whatever. They, you know, three Academy Award winners at the helm there for the, for the, yeah. the top billing. And Nikki Katz, don't forget. And Nikki Katz, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder if Soderbergh got a hand in that because Nikki Katz was in uh, The Limey. I think I so. I thought he's picked him up from The Dazed and Confused. Uh, maybe, days. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe he's a fan of the Burbs. Uh, Steve Koontz! Hey, yo, man. I want to introduce you to my friend. This is Steve Koontz. Hey, dude. When's the big unveiling, huh? Look, I got to go to work in a couple hours, you know. Ricky! Yo! Get this lame out of your yard. Get out of my yard, lame Hey! Hey! Get out of my yard! 
So I didn't realize that this was a uh, a remake uh, of a film, and also yes. this was the first time Nolan did something that he didn't write, and I think yeah. the only time, first and only so far. Yeah, yeah. you know that's funny too because like yeah. as I recall the Swedish movie, I I don't remember liking, uh, ah. but but this one I I ended up liking a lot, and you know I, I saw Memento in the theater, and didn't know what to make of it at all. Uh, had to go watch it again. And I remember even having a discussion with a friend of mine in high school, like as we were like leaving the theater, it was like either we just saw the best movie in the world or wasn't you know the, yeah. the worst movie in the world. Yeah, because it's like, yeah. did it make sense or didn't it? Yeah, it was that Donnie Darko period where you're like, wait a minute, is this gonna hold up when I watch it again, or is yeah, this exactly? Not I like that. Make sense? Yeah, <laughs> or let me let me gauge the room here. What did you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what'd you all think of yeah. uh, Donnie Darko? But, yeah. um, but 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 what's great about it, or what was interesting about Insomnia was like you know I think myself and sort of I'm sure everyone who was excited about Memento was like oh man he's gonna do something crazy he was gonna be with Al Pacino and like you know he gets into this and it's a very 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 straightforward point A to point B beautiful, beautiful film. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's a, still a film noir. It's still got a lot of the sort of memory, like snippets, and like, you know, there's a little bit of displacement there, but um, definitely not anything at the scale that he had been working at in terms of like non chronological ordering of things. But it is, yeah. it is interesting, like, you know, like fantastic sort of proving ground for can you handle the epic? Because the scale of this like tiny little, yeah, you know, uh, exactly. kitchen sink. You know, right. like film noir melodrama, because it was set on that glacier and the backdrop and everything, the scale the of it was so massive. And like the logs, the Ugh. flying in on, on that little, uh, the, the, the seaplane. <laughs> kind of shining-ish, right? Uh, yeah. You could almost feel the bum, bum, yeah. bum, right? When it was <laughs> yeah. going through those, yeah, mountainous town. And, and, and if you want to talk about uh, Wally Pfister, holy shit. Holy like, I forgot shit how good the right. look of this was. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you could yeah. you could definitely see some expertise. In, yeah, yeah. The, you could see the uh, like you said the Kubrick influence. You could see the Michael Mann influence. I think you get to, uh, he got a chance to re, uh, pay homage to the diner sequence and heat in yeah. the uh, <laughs> sequence in the on the ferry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. He's right. like, that was a yeah, great. Exactly. We've been great we, we've sequence. been chatting here like a couple of guys, <laughs> a couple of regular <laughs> fellows. Yeah. <laughs> It, was, it really, it really brought a little bit of a tear to my eye to see uh, Robin yeah. Williams again. I haven't seen him um, acting in a yeah. while. Well, yeah. it was cool because we recently watched One Hour Photo, and I think it was around the same time of him yeah. really. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember that playing one against his character there, and this was playing against type. Yeah. I just uh, this is fantastic role, right? I mean, there's there's hardly any humor in this by him at at all. No, I mean. I, I love that scene where, because, you know, I always remember the fairy scene, right? And that's just such a great scene. Wild card. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, about as, uh, you're, you're about as mysterious to me as a block <laughs> toilet is to a plumber. <laughs> I love that one. But that's... I love that scene later on where, you know, I kind of forget a little bit. It's a noir and it's a detective story, but there isn't a lot of detective solving, right? I forgot how early you find mm-hmm. out about Robin Williams and how early he finds out about Robin Williams. And that's where the tension is. It's more detective covering up. It's more. (laughs) And and this is what I've always appreciated about the film. Like the film stops being more about the mystery and usually it playing against the serial killer uh, tropes, but it's more about how is Al Pacino dealing with the guilt and the situation he finds himself because of it. Right. He is on the one hand, you know, battling his inner demons, and having to, at the same time, fight, you know, the manipulation that's going on with Robin Williams' character, right? And so mm-hmm. uh, it, it's great, just narratively speaking, that at some point, his own personal well-being and kind of escaping the legal ramifications of his past actions are pitted against him bringing Robin Williams to justice. It's just like, great, right? It's like, what is he going to do? And eventually we see kind of the decisions he makes. And when he he decides that after being kind of haunted by his past, that the only way he can absolve himself is by, you know, being brought to justice Mm -hmm. with, you know, taking down Robin Williams. Um, But I love that scene where Robin Williams gets on the phone and is constantly calling him. And, you know, (laughs) you kind of understand that he has no choice but to engage him. But... (laughs) you get that scene when Robin Williams like explains how the murder happened. And it's just, it's interesting just how it unfolds, right? Like, you know, (laughs) not to quote heat again, but they're sitting there talking like regular guys. And then all of a sudden Robin Williams goes on this tangent where you see where he's, have you ever been humiliated? Will 
yeah, where he crosses. <laughs> yeah, it's got a little bit of, of Manhunter too, right? Um, you ever seen Blood in the Moonlight? Well, yeah, I mean, he Robin Williams is just so fucking good. I mean, he he's like the perfect creep. I mean, he totally believes everything that he's saying. He has this internal logic to, well, you know, he had to do it because, you know, she was humiliated him. Well, he was vulnerable. I mean, it's just right. like bone chilling the, the way he does it so like matter of factly. It's chilling mm-hmm. because you see how someone that's generally well composed and rational yeah. could suddenly veer off into this psychotic justification for his actions. And you see that in that conversation you have. Meanwhile... You know, Al Pacino's struggling to stay awake and figure out how to handle it. And I just I love how the scene ends and he's like, yeah, so uh, how was it for you killing your partner? <laughs> and he just hangs up the phone. <laughs> he's like, okay, I told you, now you tell me. And he's like, oh, I'm done with this. <laughs> no, exactly. What I love about the, the sort of structure of this one, you know, it, it starts off, okay, there's there's been a murder and we're, we're calling in the big guns to solve it. And like, you know, okay, it's a police procedural. We, we kind of know the drill, yeah. right? And then a- as it's going, like, it kind of turns into something else, and he kills his partner, and like, whoa, that was different. And then, you know, he has this weird connection with Robin Williams, and, the, and then they, you know, are they going to form a partnership and, like, you know, frame the, the uh, ex-boyfriend or whatever? You, you kind of don't know how far these things are going to go. Yeah. And then it becomes mostly about Al Pacino sort of reckoning with his guilt over... Not just this, where he killed his partner, but also all the other things that he's he's sort of done and like lost his way, slippery slope that he exactly he lost himself in the fog, right? And it becomes more about this like kind of kitchen sink drama and him trying not to pass that along, and and it's interesting because it starts off genre and goes towards something a lot more sort of dramatic, and and it's sort of the inverse of the way that we experienced following where it starts off kind of like kitchen sink and dramatic and like oh it's a ho-hum like an exploration I am, film. yeah yeah like i i just like go follow people you know it's a thing to mm. do and i'm lonely to you know like hyper genre toward the end like this one is just the other way around where it starts off extremely genre and like focuses into uh, a, a, yeah. an actual drama and like a morality play yeah and, and that's where i see the the michael mann influence right i mean it's like on the right. surface, you can have a subject matter that can have a very strong like, genre appeal. But what really makes the, the films great and what makes you really invested is that the personal drama, the personal stakes, that kind of kitchen sink quality to it um, mm-hmm. that you wouldn't normally associate with those genres, right? Well, and, and, and what's fantastic about that is like how it's unlocked, like him having to get in touch with like what really matters and, like, and him trying to pull his soul back out of this like you know calloused world that he had been in is because of the sort of vulnerability he's put in because he's like not sleeping for six days or whatever it was you broke my record will (laughs) and i think for a long time you know that's why i always felt that insomnia and it'd be weird you know to think about this but was one of his better films or you know one of my i think probably until interstellar was probably one of my favorite nolan films because although his films are always innovative and very intriguing, very interesting, very intelligent. Like I just felt that the one quality that was great about this film is that it was about a character struggling with an inner conflict and seeing him redeeming himself at the end, right? And oftentimes I felt like that kind of emotional catharsis was missing in a lot of his films. Mm-hmm. And and in this one, even though you don't you wouldn't associate it as this having that quality because like you said of the on the surface genre appeal of the film, like You know, it really, if you think about what he's struggling with, is that guilt haunting him and not being able to escape it, right? He goes into this place seemingly to escape his transgressions and finds himself in a place where he can't stop but confronting him. And I just love that scene where he he finally confesses and gets it off his chest. And he's like, she listens to him and he sits there and tells us this thing that's haunting him that, that could unravel his whole existence. And she's being non-judgmental at all, you know, and that's the interesting part, right? Like, was this the more a tyranny conversation? Yeah, this is the moral quandary that you find yourself in. Like, you, you did this illegal act for a good intention, and he can't reconcile that. But he can't expect us to provide that redemption for him. It has to come from him, and it, it's very subtle, but it's just such a great part to include in the film, which is that, like, although Hillary Swank, in a way, is angry to have been deceived by him, sees his 
valor and his sacrifice at the end and is willing to to keep that a secret not stain his reputation yeah exactly. uh, for his sacrifice but he says he doesn't he let turns her down the, he turns down the gesture because it goes back to a line at the beginning of the film which is once you cross that line the slippery slope there's no go, right there's no it's a slippery slope there's no going yeah. back you and lose that's, your way yeah. yeah and to me that's the other parallel with heat which is there's this idea exactly. that even though you wouldn't think of it you take a detective who spends his whole career, as he says, taking down guys like Robin Williams. And you take Robin Williams, they both crossed this transgressive line. Mm-hmm. Didn't and even blink. Didn't even blink. <laughs> and kind of defined themselves in a certain way. And so mm-hmm. what he's doing is kind of taking that back and saying, no, this, you know, this isn't right. You, you got to you gotta stop it because once it starts, it doesn't stop, right? Right. Well, and, and that's what, exactly, that, that is what's so great about the that scene you're talking about with the Al Pacino character psychoanalyzing the killer he's never met about, you know, he crossed the line and didn't even blink. And yeah, it's like, you know, now that he's done it, he's going to do it again. Like, you know, the thing is he is not exactly talking about the Robin Williams character. He's talking about himself. Yeah, exactly. I thought that was pretty clear, but it was really well written. Yeah. Uh, Right. Exactly. And and really you, you end up seeing that because him pulling out his drop piece and yeah. putting himself in a situation where he may or may not have shot his partner intentionally was him doubling back on that line, right? He did it once by soiling the undergarments of the serial killer and helping expedite that prosecution. And now he's done it again by covering his tracks, right? And I love that Robin Williams really preys on that yeah. and, and and highlights something that I, I always wonder if it's even legally accurate, which is that like just because he's found guilty and tampering evidence in one case that every person he's ever helped convict yeah. would go free. I, I, but... I'm sure it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, 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 but it is funny how like Robin Williams is almost like the uh, Joker-fied uh, Sammy Jenkins. It's like this uh, aspect of the Al Pacino's. Yeah, uh, I thought he wasn't you know, real for a while. Um, I, yeah, yeah. It, it, it kind of plays that way. Which I thought all these movies had that. I, I thought uh, Joe Pants wasn't real at one point yeah, when I first yeah. saw Memento, and I didn't Cobb. think that um, Cobb was and, real. And I, yeah. It almost feels like Cobb wasn't real uh, You know, at the very end there. Uh, Even the at the end. Yeah. yeah. Oh, also, you just brought up a good point. There's also this idea that not only is this this play on whether or not the characters are real and they may be a manifestation of the protagonist, mm-hmm. but, and this is, again very Michael Mann, there's this use of mise-en-scene to really convey that, which is all the, the protagonists in these three films, or at least the, the first two films, really take on the clothes and even physical um, Shorter hair characteris- and, characteristics mm-hmm. of these characters that we're not sure are they, mm-hmm. re- that we start to question even whether or not they exist, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And, and and I love, I mean, like, speaking of the sort of like expressionism, the, the sort of visual metaphors, and everything, I love, love, love the reoccurring images like the opening images of insomnia and this reoccurring thing of like the bandage it's like it's like the blood in the fabric and and you don't know how it got there you don't know what it is you see these disembodied hands dealing with it and i I think for the longest time you're supposed to think that that was robin williams getting rid of the the body of um of, of the woman he killed um but then, you know, sort of later reveal that that was actually Al Pacino doing this thing. And what was great was like, you know, as he's using his dropper to plant this blood, you know, he accidentally spills a drop on his own sleeve. And then he tries to wipe it off and it only sort of makes it worse. And it's sort of this like Lady Macbeth style Out damn yeah. spot. image. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. And this, the, that aspect of, you know, there's no crime you can walk away with cleanly, you know, is just, you see it in practice, like how in order to, get, you know get away from one crime he starts committing all these crimes and like the extent to which he has to go to like re you know swap the bullets and (laughs) shoot a dog dog. (laughs) take it out of the dog bring it in yeah jesus yeah race ahead of the cops to plant the evidence then he puts it in and robin williams is one step ahead that that's another another great link to this idea that robin williams could be just a part of his own character is just how he's always one step ahead you know right yeah I, I had a little uh, silent partner in there uh, a little yeah. bit with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he, bit, he even yeah. had a little verbal Kent there. He's like, yeah, he's, the, he's like, I always wanted to be a cop. Yeah. <laughs> was in a barbershop quartet. The way, the, the way yeah. he rants reminds me a little bit of verbal Kent. Yeah, that's true. Well, also the, the, the Walter Finch character, the Robin Williams character, was this um, you know writer who uh, gets sucked into a, a web of film noir. 
Um, yeah. But Are you saying he's a Coen Brothers character? <laughs> Almost. Well, I, I, I meant I was, I was referring to a following, like, like the, the main oh, character yeah. there. Oh, yeah, he's a, a writer. Yeah, he's a writer. True. Yeah, he's a writer, but he doesn't yeah. write. <laughs> he follows. You know. Yeah. Uh, he's but a follower. Continuing this idea of like maybe <laughs> Robin Williams wasn't real, the sort of chase along the log... Uh, I don't know what they were. Just like logs floating in the in the That's how bay they, there. They move them from one place to another, right? They just send them down. Yeah. And, and it's like you know what a nightmare it was, like being underwater there, and like as you're watching it, you're like you're getting that anxiety, like <gasps> am I gonna be able? Yeah. He's gonna hold his breath, and like I and always you see do the, that, the two right? logs like, yeah, like smash together, and no. it's like you know, he like almost gets like, out of one one or two of them, and it's like you could feel it like pinching their fingers, yeah, and, you exactly. know, like oh god, <laughs> so brutal. And I I love how again the the situation that Al Pacino finds himself in, and then the conflict like is just driving towards the decision he has to make, and and this is the other thing that I think you know in general makes for a great film and. You know, Nolan does so perfectly in this film, which is like, how do you take the character and keep pushing up against these corners, up against these walls to a point where he's just got to make a decision. Right. And and in doing so, the character has like a very satisfying arc, which is I love how Robin Williams is like looking forward to coming in for the interview. And he's like, he's like, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not bring up the boyfriend. Let them come to it. It's like First fucking thing. And he shows up. He's like, I don't know. Yeah. You should really look at the boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that part, it was great. Your boyfriend, Randy, abusive <laughs> little prick. He hit her. We know all this already, Fetch. No, but it was getting worse. Why all this eagerness to talk about Randy Stats, Fetch? Oh, you're right. I'm sorry, Detective. That's probably all hearsay anyway, and I, I don't want to say anything that could be taken the wrong way. As like a, a career thing, it was interesting looking at insomnia now i i I know it's sort of um his least lauded film and like doesn't get the same love that some of his other movies do i thought it was great i I mean i i really like it i I think it's i think it's really up there i I think if anything if i had a critique i think the ending does come a little quick and things get a little truncated at the end but i thought it was satisfying and i thought it kind of turned hillary swank into kind of the new uh protagonist by the end and we see like the end of her uh heroic journey because she was all about him she was almost like his uh protege and she wanted him to be this hero that she kind of built up in her own mind of this awesome la cop you know coming to alaska this small town but right. you know, yeah. she found out he was crooked and that was kind of ruined it for her. But I, I thought yeah. that that was a great ending, you know. Exactly. And and it's great how she gets disillusioned by the end there and, yeah. and has to sort of reckon with that. And she's so fucking good in everything, you know. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't lying that way. How do you know? Because I saw him. Are we almost done here? My nads are freezing off. While we're kind of talking about like other performances and stuff in here, like Robin Williams, as we said, was was great. Uh, Al Pacino, like somehow putting on his face what it feels like to be up for way, way too long, and it was and painful. At it times. hurt it was painful to, to see at. how exactly. sleep deprived he was. And I, I didn't even know how he d- like. And at first, it's funny because you don't see that coming. You know, he feels a little bit like he's got a little Vincent Hanna coming on. You know, he's always yeah, going to be yeah. amped up. And, yeah, you know, come on, and, you know, yeah, yeah, come on, Will. That's bullshit. Fuck you, care. You know, always on the edge, right where he needs to be. It keeps me sharp on the edge where I got to be. Well, it's funny because, like, (laughs) it's very Vincent Hanna. Like, I love how he just shows up and it's like, here are the 15 things you missed over here, you know? Right. I mean, it's almost exactly the scene where he shows up, you know, questioning everybody uh, what they see from the crime scene. I love the cocky detective move. You know, they they come in, they're just like, "Uh." and then uh, what about that uh, piece of paper on the floor? Which one? Exactly, you know, yeah, like yeah. They, they saw the one thing that 12 other people didn't see, you know? Right. Yeah. It's like, that's all in the report. <laughs> but how the setting ends up weighing on him and imposing itself on him with the constant daylight is just such a great use of mise en scene. I yeah. think they do it kind of the opposite effect in the latest season of True Detective because it's kind of, you know, all night. Nighttime. Oh, it's always yeah. dark. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's always dark, which is cool, but it just makes Alaska such a great setting. And I think it's just encapsulated perfectly by the woman that runs the hotel. And she, there's only two types of people yeah. out there, you know, those that were born there and those that are running away from something, you know, and mm-hmm. it's um, just I wasn't born here. she wasn't yeah. born there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maura Tierney was really great. She had to leave uh, Jim Carrey from Liar Liar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, I just, I just, it's so great to see. And, and I think the best film noirs. And again, going back to Thief, it's just like how you have the setting becoming a character, but not just a character, right. but becoming a force 
or an antagonist to the protagonist, right? Um, and it's like it's him fighting up against his own guilt, his conscientiousness, and his sense of justice. And ultimately, he has to choose between having this kid take the fall for it or really bringing everything to light. Yeah, and it's it's something where having Nolan take on like essentially like you know supposedly yes he 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 definitely wanted to make this movie and he was pushing for it but in some sense this is like kind of an audition film can you work within the studio system can you be trusted to make uh, something at a bigger scale and it's fascinating that like on his sort of more uh, assignment style work you know he, he didn't have the being able to like do the puzzle box the same way and fall back on that as sort of a crutch you know he didn't get to write the screenplay you know it was it was already written and like and it's a remake right it, it, exactly and it's good too because it was like it it didn't have the sort of like big twist ending the way his previous two films did yeah, yeah. and i think and i think all, all these things were good for him in terms of like uh having to flex those muscles having to like show he, he, he can uh play well with others or whatever right and then actually tell a story w- with this sort of like human core to it um, you know, unlike maybe I don't know M Night Shyamalan, who like got just so well known for, okay, twist. here comes the twist. We're gonna yeah. have the twist, and and the audience gets yeah. like bored by that. And him not being able to like do his usual bag of tricks was really really refreshing. And and on top of that, he made it this really satisfying and interesting and like almost eye popping movie uh, for, for such a contained thriller. Some of those shots of the outside felt like IMAX almost. Yeah, it, it did. It, it just felt flying so in. Yeah. large. Yeah, Whoa. it was just beautiful scale. Well, that's why, I, that's why I love this film. I, I think there is something that's really powerful about having a director maybe direct something that they don't write. I mean, you see it with um, Quentin Tarantino and Jackie Brown, probably my favorite Tarantino movie. And, yeah. and there's just this idea that like, if you're writing it, it maybe comes out of you and you know, you're telling a story. But if you're directing something you didn't write, then you're interpreting it. And then there's this idea of taking, you know, a subject matter that you have to decide how to, how to show. In this case, you could have played it like a straight mystery. Instead, here you find out very early on who the serial killer is. And then the movie becomes something else, which is about Al Pacino's character and him coming to terms for his past transgressions, right? So Yeah, this could have been seven, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's noteworthy <laughs> because you don't see I'm trying to think, I don't think you see a lot of redemption in Christopher Nolan's films, right? I mean, it's like Memento, in, in, he's running away from it. Not often. I mean, uh, Prestige, uh, The Dark yeah. Knights, definitely not. Um, Dunkirk didn't come close to any of those things. I mean, even Oppenheimer. I mean, I felt like yeah. there is an obsession, you know, with him having a security clearance, but this idea of like really... <laughs> well, he, he has kind of a su- tragic uh, realization, but it, it's not a personal one. It's only... Yeah, it's not a with, redemption journey, you it, know. Um, that, yeah, exactly. And that's because, like you said, in, in a lot of the films, it's about explaining how the puzzle works or explaining how the world or, you know, the setup works, right? If you think about, like, how much time is spent in Inception and in Tenet, that there isn't a lot of time for it. But you take that away, you strip that away, and then you show the audience what they really have here, which is a story about guilt and redemption and how do we come to terms with our actions. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. That point of redemption, it is one of the things that, because I love the prestige too, but I feel like it's the one element that's missing in prestige. Right. They didn't have the prestige of the redemption part, exactly. They had the turn, but not the prestige. Right. right. You yeah, have exactly. Hugh Jackman cross that line, and you have that transgression, that Faustian deal he makes to go beyond yeah. the illusion to real magic, but there's no redemption for him. No. And that really weakens I, I feel like the emotional impact that you could have gotten out of a story that was just like memento just so expertly crafted right in terms of what you're shown and much like memento recreates what it feels like to be in a dream the prestige recreates what it feels like to be part and witness to an illusion but where's that kind of emotional arc that you wanted from the hugh jackman character right mm. don't you listen you take it away show them what they have so we'll be bringing you back for our magic, crime magic uh, <laughs> block, uh, including The Prestige. Or, or perhaps uh, very the similar magician. films coming out at the same time. We could do The Illusionist. And the oh, the God, Illusionist, yeah, the that's Illusionist, what it was. Right. Yeah. yeah, some twin films, yeah. Yes? Are you laughing now? 
Andy, thank you again for joining us. It was great talking film noir, film crime film, uh, Michael Mann-esque. Uh, Christopher <laughs> Nolan films with you. Um, you will, we will definitely have to have you on for the Magician show. Thanks a lot. <laughs> definitely. It's always great to stay on the edge right where I got to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next time on the show, uh, we will be talking Sergio Martino Giallo films with The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward from 1971 and Torso from 1973. We're finally getting into some Giallo. We haven't done that yet. Finally. Yeah, well, we've done some Canadian Gialli uh, with... Um, a? a? Gialli? With uh, Stone Cold Dead was kind of one, right? And then we I'd had, say The uh, Silent Partner had, had a bit partner, of that, too. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it is uh, a very, very interesting subgenre. Is it horror? Is it film noir? <laughs> Stay tuned and you'll find out. Are they booby slasher films, pre-80s <laughs> booby slasher films? They, yes. yes, they are. We, we can check off all the boxes. All yeah, those check off every one of the yeah. boxes, actually. <laughs> all right, that'll be a fun one, and uh, so we'll be back for some, uh, some slashers. Thank you so much for listening. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on all the podcasts and social platforms at the Grindhouse Institute. And if you really want to give us a boost, check us out on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps us to get noticed. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be back next time. Ciao. Killing changes you. You know that. It's not guilt. I never meant to do it. It's like awareness. Life is so important. How could it be so fucking fragile?